It is true. We love you here at Cornerstone. Good morning. We're so glad that you're worshiping together with us. If you're here in the room, welcome. Those joining us online, welcome as well. We are so blessed to be worshiping the Lord together. Amen? It's already been a powerful morning. We're excited for more of what God wants to do in speaking with us. We're in a theme called Bad Friends. Bad Friends. Uh, And it's because we see throughout the Bible all of these examples of bad friends. Friends, where people are bad friends to God and to each other. But we know this, that despite us being bad friends, God is always a good friend. And so we've seen time after time about how God loves us and shows us the way to live for him. In fact, that's what we use so often is this imagery of walking with Jesus. And we do so because that's who we are. We are people on a journey with Christ. None of us has arrived. All of us are still going after him because none of us is perfect. And because of that, we're walking with Jesus until we meet him face to face. And part of that journey is to be more like him, to be more like Jesus. We do that through loving God, through making disciples, and reaching the world. Part of that is is beyond our weekend gatherings here. It's in our life groups. And I would encourage you to be a part of life groups. We have only a couple weeks left before they take a break. But then right after Easter, we're actually going to go right back into them. So I encourage you to, to be a part of a life group to be intentional in growing in your relationship with God. Now, how many people know they do what they want to do? You do what you want to do? With your extra time, I mean, you're going to do it. You're going to make time. People are busy, so busy. How busy are you? So busy. Man, I'm so busy. I barely got here this morning. You know what I'm talking about? I'm just busy. This is what I got to be. But no, that's how it is. But if you're intentional, then you will carve out time to build relationship with each other, to connect, that you will Grow in your relationship with Christ in a Bible or book study. You'll grow with God and you'll serve. You use your abilities for others. So let me encourage you that you would take those steps to be more like Jesus. Now, we've been talking about in this theme of bad friends, we've been talking about and using the Apostles' Creed. And that's something that is actually a statement of faith that many churches throughout the, throughout the time of the church have agreed upon from the earliest years in the 300s all the way to today. Some using this statement of faith every single week. But for us, it's not a normal thing that we do. But during this series, we're taking a look to look at these words and to look at their depth and, their, and what they mean and the the, just the, the depth of meaning and what we believe together with our brothers and sisters in Christ across the world. So as we read these words together aloud today, think about their meaning more than just a cursory reading, but actually what you're saying out of your mouth as we believe them together. Let's read it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell, rose again from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty who will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy global church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. That's a statement of faith of who we are and what we believe and what Christ has done on our behalf. Now, bad friends. We've been talking about all these different people throughout scripture that have been a bad friend, and we're continuing today. So if you have your Bible, your tablet, your phone, we're opening to Acts 9, and we're going to jump off in this place, taking a look here. And it says in Acts 9, 15, and the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Today we're talking about enemies to allies. Here's a question. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much 
Lord, for your word as you speak to us. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would breathe upon it and speak to us. Lord, that we would go away from this place changed more into your image. We pray this in the powerful name that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, we've been talking about this question, what makes a good friend? What makes a good friend? And We talked about all the different character traits that are there about what makes a good friend. And in the scripture, we talk about uh, people that were called a friend and a good friend, and that starts with Abraham. And we see it in scripture. James writes in the New Testament about Abraham. He says, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Now, this is a huge statement because that means that he was in a relationship with God where God called him a friend. What a profound thing to be said about your life, that the holy God of the universe would call you a friend. And what was that reason? Is because it says that, that Abraham was the father of our faith. It means he lives in faith, and faith is taking a step into things that we do not know and trusting in God. So as God told him to leave his family and his father's house to go to a place I will show you, he did so trusting God in obedience. So it's not just believing, but also acting in our will to align ourselves with the obedience to follow after what God says. And not just to do that, but to do it with some immediacy. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's like God's like, hey, you need to forgive that person. And I'm like, I'm gonna next week. Because right now, I feel so warm with all the hatred. It feels like a blanket. And it's just like, I hate them so much. And I'm so warm, God. The people laughing know what I'm talking about. But he's like, hey, hey, I forgave you. You're called to forgive others. And so with immediacy, whenever we're obedient, say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I forgive them. I turn them over to you. I'm no longer carrying that burden. I'm going to give it to you. This week, man, in preparing for this message, and the things we're going to talk about, these names started popping up, things that hurt me in my life, people that had offended me to my face. And the big shiny handles that are on those weights were sitting right there for me to grab them and pick them up and start carrying them again. And I was like, no, I am not going to pick these things back up. I'm not picking up this unforgiveness anymore. I'm not going to do any of these things. I have given that to the Lord. Those things belong there at the foot of the cross. I'm not going to burden myself with it. Those are God's and God is a just God. And so God help us all, myself included, as we walk forgiving others. We walk in the forgiveness of God that we would not be bad friends. Now, this, marks, uh, this month marks the month of Ramadan. And some of our friends across the world, over a billion people, are actually celebrating Ramadan. And you think about this from their belief system. It's actually, as we lived in the Middle East, an amazing time of festivity with friends. And they would actually light up the night with these different... Um, type of lamps, all different colors as they're celebrating this time of year for them. And it's a, mar it's a time marked with holiness and coming together and sharing meals. And so from that perspective is actually one where it's supposed to be a sacred time. And they're supposed to be fasting during the day, which means that they're not, they're not supposed to eat from sun up to sundown, no water, no food. So it's, it's a big deal, and, and people really hold to it, and, and it's something crazy because it shifts the whole life of everything that's going on. So when we were living in, in Cairo and Alex and traveling to other places, that's what would happen, and they would shift their whole life, and kids are playing sports at 2 o'clock at night because like the whole world just shifts time schedules because they're supposed to fast during the day. And so it's a really interesting thing. And we had people, friends of mine, who run business, and they would, you know, they would be up all night and take a quick nap and have, a, have that meal before sunup. And then they would be about their business in the day, fasting and being there and trying not to be mad because they're so hangry at everybody around them. And I can, I can relate. And so 
Here was the crazy thing is that we, they would have what's called the breaking of fast or the iftar meal. And, and that meal, they would actually invite us to come and participate. Knowing that we did not believe as they believed, they would come and invite us into their homes. Amazing spreads of food. All this amazing food that was there, this Middle Eastern stuff, so good. And they would welcome us to be a part of their family, to be a part of their friends and invite us into their home. What a profound thing to invite others to be a part of you. And, and we felt very much included. In, and at the same time, we don't believe like they believe. We believe that Jesus is the only way. It's because that's what Jesus himself said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so as we would be invited to an iftar, we too would fast. But our fasting would be in prayer that our friends and our loved ones, all of these neighbors of ours, would have a revelation of Jesus Christ and as they're trying to earn their way to a holy God, we know as broken people that none of us can earn our way to a holy God. No matter how good we live, no matter how many good things we do, no matter how much good things you give to the poor and so on and so forth, you can't do it. We need a sacrifice on our behalf, and that is Jesus Christ. And so we come to a place as we look at the faces of people we think about Cairo, we think about Alexander, we think all these beautiful people walking, millions of people that are praying and fasting this month, your neighbors in your neighborhood, that you would stop and you would pray for them, that as they are seeking to know God, that Jesus would reveal himself to them. And they would have the understanding of who Jesus is personally in their lives. I want to stop and pray right now that we would be those that pray for our neighbors that they would know Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you so much that you are a God of revelation. Lord, you have called us by your Holy Spirit to yourself. Lord, and because of it, Lord, we can repent and be made right standing with you. Lord, we can't earn your grace. Your grace is given. Lord, and it is by your sacrifice for us that we can receive it by faith. So Lord, we pray that you in this time as people across the world are seeking you, Lord, we pray that you would reveal yourself to them in a dream and in a vision, in conversations with friends as they share their testimony with others. Lord, in that it would be profound as many, many would turn to you and to know you, Lord Jesus, personally, inviting you into their lives. Lord, we thank you in advance, Lord, as these lives are changed and their families are changed and their communities are changed and dare I say countries are changed for the glory of God and the personhood of Jesus. We pray all this in your precious name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we pick up here in this story looking at what it means to be a bad friend. And it's pretty much wrapped up in this one guy called Saul. Now, I love the Apostle Paul, but his backstory is pretty gnarly, okay? Because Saul is someone who was passionately convinced that he was right. He was passionately convinced that what he was doing was honoring God. And so he was there holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen, who bludgeoned him to death with rocks for his faith in Jesus Christ. And Stephen turned his face to God and it said it shone like the sun as, as, as heaven shone upon him as he preached the word of God and gave up his spirit as they killed him for his faith in Jesus. And Saul stood right there. And was smiling about it. And it said he did so because he was convinced that what they were doing was against God. And it sounds like other people we know around the world that would kill Christ followers because they think what they're doing will honor God. It picks up here in Acts 8. It says, And Saul approved of his execution, meaning Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made a great lamentation or weeping over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. You think about this question. Who is your enemy? Who is your enemy? Some of you guys flashed on a face right now. Ooh. Ooh. Who is your enemy? For the early church, Saul, man, he personified their enemy. I was thinking about when we lived in Cairo. 
and we were setting up our life in Alexandria. We were part of a team in Cairo and then pastoring in, in Alex, and we're moving back and forth. And we were buying an apartment for the church in Alexandria for us to have a place to base ministry out of and live. And My friend Ashraf is a very wealthy businessman, a Coptic Christian, Christ follower. We bought an apartment from him, and he was dealing with us, and I made an appointment. And as I came in, it was the day after this church service where someone walked in in December and detonated a vest and killed innocent people inside the church in Cairo. And his 12-year-old niece and his family members were in that group. And they died going to church. And I sat there with them and we cried and we prayed. And I'll be real honest and be honest. It's hard not to get angry, to get furious, to want to get even, to get ahead. But I was reminded. By him, this is not the first time. I weren't going to forgive. Because that's what Jesus said to do. We're not going to shrink back. And they went to church at that same church the next week. Burnt in the whole front of it in ashes. They still had service. Because they're not going to live in fear and let someone dictate to them what they do in worshiping their God. Yeah. Fast forward, and man, it was tough. We're in Alexandria, it's a beautiful city, seven million people along the ocean there in the Mediterranean. It was tough. I'm going to grab a tissue. We're with friends. It's Palm Sunday. We have our service in the morning. It's a beautiful time. Friends of ours, they, they go to celebrate too at the Coptic Church in the afternoon. And we get news that in Tanta, someone walked into the church and detonated a vest. And then they walk into the courtyard trying to get into the church in Alex. It's four miles from my house. And they detonate it and kill innocent people. It was on CNN. It's a blurb. ISIS claims responsibility for killing all these people. And I had friends who were there in the courtyard and their friends are gone. Gone. People would ask me, Jay, what's the hard part about coming back to America? Is it getting used to this stuff? And I was like, no. It's that people play church. They play church. We don't play church. We play for keeps. And the hard part is, is that we're playing for keeps in America too. We just don't act like it. breaks my heart. The Lord help us. How will our neighbors know unless we tell them? How will our communities know unless we act like it? Unless we be more like Jesus? God help us. And help us to forgive so that we can live the love of Christ. Like our brothers and sisters across the world who play for keeps. So the enemy of the church is ravishing the church. It says in Acts 9, but still, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters of the synagogues at Damascus so that if he would found anything belonging to the way, it's the way of following Jesus, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. See, as I said, he was passionate. He thought what he was doing was right, but he was passionately wrong. And friends, I'll tell you this. I have friends that believe all sorts of stuff. They are good people with good values and they have great families. But this is what I know, is that you can be passionately wrong. 
And the reason is because it's not what I believe, it's what Jesus says. And I believe what Jesus says. Jesus says it like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you can say, Jay, you know, I don't disagree with you. That's okay. You can disagree with me. But you're going to have to take that up with Jesus. Because if you're a Christ follower and you don't believe the words of Jesus, you're not a Christ follower. And I'm sorry that's rough. I wish it was easier. I wish you could do whatever you want, get to put a label on your chest. But that's not how it works. That isn't for me either. Because if we don't live that way, then it doesn't count for us either. I'm sorry that's rough. And I'm sorry that's so in your face. But that's how Jesus was too. And when the religious people didn't like it, Jesus spoke the truth in love so that we all included could turn and ask forgiveness and live for the righteousness of God. It picks up here, as we said, and it says that now as he went on his way, meaning Saul, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I think Jesus got his attention. And what's amazing to me is that in the middle of this whole thing, that God would love his very enemy. He said, who are you, Lord? (laughs) Who are you, Lord? You knocked me off a horse with a beam from the sky. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Maybe Jesus was serious when he said, love your enemy. Pray for those that persecute you. Who's your enemy? Are you praying for him? Can you show him the love of God? It says, and now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here am I, Lord. Doesn't that sound like a good thing when the Lord says, hey, hey, you. You're like, I'm right here. Lord, what is it? He's like, guess what? I got a mission for you. Here it is. The Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight in the house of Judas and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so he might regain his sight. What Ananias doesn't know is that God has struck Saul down and made him blind and that Saul has gone three days without eating or drinking, having this time to really think about what he's been doing to Jesus. And meanwhile, Ananias is like, Lord, you just called me out. And I was like, I'm here. And he's like, hey, go talk to Saul. And he's like, what? What did you say? And he says to him, Lord, I've heard many from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. He's like, in case you didn't know God of the universe, this guy hates us, like capital H hates us. Hates our stinking guts, right? You make me vomit. That's how he feels about us. It's one of these. But our God, rich in mercy, says, go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine. But he belongs to me to carry the name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my See, Paul, he gets it. He realizes that in his passion to earn God's favor, he had been all wrong. There are people that fight for things in this world, jihadists or crazy on the other side, that think what they're doing is fighting, and it's the right noble thing to do. And they're so misguided. They need the living God. And so Saul has this change of heart as Ananias goes and says, Brother Saul, 
and prays for him, and he's restored. And it says that full of the Holy Spirit, he began to preach the name of Jesus from that time forward. And it says he went from there, and he actually spent three years in the desert. You can find it in, in uh, Galatians. And it talks about this time that he spent with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, three years in the desert. And during that time, this is what I believe, is that just like the disciples who spent those years with Jesus, that's what Saul was doing, spending this time with the Lord as well. And whether that be, it says Arabia, whether that be in Saudi or that be in the Arabian desert of what they saw as Turkey at that time outside of Tarsus, it doesn't matter. What it meant is that he got deep with God so that he could effectively do the ministry of what God wanted him to do. He went deep with God. Just like the disciples walking with God, that's what Saul was doing. And what happened is that he became transformed into someone new in Paul. And it kind of just skims over it that he became Paul and it goes from there because there was a new revelation of who he was. Because they didn't trust him at first. None of the church trusted him. He showed up. They were like, this is a nice ruse. We're not believing it. You know what I mean? You are the popo. You're coming to get us. You know? <laughs> I smell a rat, right? It is you. They're pointing at him. Man. <laughs> but he's brought in. And they're like, listen, no, he's preaching about Jesus Christ. And they embrace him. And it says he's even spent time with Peter. And that together, God was doing something amazing in his life to go and have this destiny that was so much bigger than what he thought he could acquire. Now, he was. He was the top of the Pharisees' Pharisee. He was the guy. He had all the, all the credentials to be a Jew's Jew and to be the man. And God uses him not to talk to them, but to talk to the Gentiles. What an amazing thing our God does. And so we have all these journeys of the missionary journeys that he went out upon with partners. They went out and planted the church. Even where we became the, with the name Christ followers comes from the churches that they planted. We're going to talk about it in, in series to come, but what a powerful thing to think about a destiny that's so much beyond what we can garner or what we can attain by ourselves because we abandon our plans and go after God. Now, in this series, Bad Friends, we've had some great takeaways. Pastor Angus shared a great message about Zacchaeus last week. And I want you to know this, that God sees you right where you are. Just as he shared about Zacchaeus, God also sees you wherever you are. You're not hiding away from God. It's not that he's overlooking you. He sees you. Luke 19 says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. I must stay at your house today. God sees you where you are. Not just that, but God loves you. He loves you very much. Even whenever Judas was turning his back on Jesus, Jesus was reaching out to Judas, wanting Judas to turn back to him. Even in the intimacy of Judas being a traitor to him in the garden, Jesus asked that question, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Would you do so and intimately betray me like this? See, Jesus loved Judas. Even in that moment, Jesus loved Judas. And even as you have made sins and mistakes against God, he loves you too. And he wants you to turn back from those things, repent and embrace him today. God loves you. Very, very much. And God wants to transform you into his image. He wants you to live differently than those, the wreck that you are. We think of Jacob and his story. We think about all that, that he has, what was prophesied over him, is saying he's a cheater, he's a heel grabber, he's, he's doing all these things, and he lived up to it. And he stole things away from his brother, and he tried to make a way, the fighting and doing all he could do to make a way. And we realize that in his time in the desert, in his time as a shepherd, that the Lord changed him and transformed him as he would follow after the way of God. And it's the same for you. It's the same for me. No longer was he named cheater, but blessed and belonging. 
God appeared to Jacob again, and he came from Padam Aram and blessed him and said, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. That you are belonging to God. Not just that, but God calls you. In the life of Moses, we saw all of the miracles that had happened to make him who he was. And then he goes and messes it all up. And he flees for his life and he runs too to the desert where he, as a shepherd, learns what it means to follow after God. And God calls to him from the bush and speaks to him and charges him with a destiny that's so much more than what he thought. He says to Moses, Come and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. See, that's our God. He sees you where you are. He loves you very much. He'll transform your life into his image. And he'll call you to a destiny that's so much bigger than your own. That's what he did in the life of Saul who became Paul. He saw him as his enemy and loved him anyway. He transformed his life in the whole direction he was going and called him to a greater destiny. That's what God has for you. That's what he believes about you. So I'll ask you this question. Whose side are you on? Are you for God or are you against him? I'm going to ask the worship team to come. We have this question that we ask often. It's an important one because you have to make the decision for yourself. Can't be your neighbor, can't be your loved one, your mother, your father, no one else, just you. The question is, have you embraced Jesus? So you can give mental assent to Jesus, but have you embraced him? Have you embraced Jesus? The symbol of the cross is one for us of freedom. It's one of forgiveness. The symbol of the cross is one where Jesus took all of our sins and all of our mistakes. He took them to the cross and he paid for them with his life. And he's the only one that could do it. He lived a sinless life for us so that we could be reconnected to the Father. In fact, in Scripture, it says it like this, as Paul writes to the church at Rome. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. Friends, today is your day of salvation. Today is your opportunity to make it right with God, to ask him to forgive you of your sins and invite him into your life. Maybe you've made that decision before. You need to recommit back to that decision. Or maybe you're making it for the very first time. Either way, I encourage you to make the decision today that you would follow Jesus. I'm going to ask if you're here in the room, if you just stand right where you're at, just bow your heads. If you're online, you would just prepare your heart. And heads are about here. If that's you, and you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, if you just raise your hand right where you're at, I just want to acknowledge you making a decision to follow after God today. Invite him into your life. I see a hand that's here, a hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Others making a decision to follow Jesus today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If that's you online, you're making a decision to follow Jesus, we rejoice with you making a decision to follow God, to invite Jesus into your life, to change your life. It's a simple prayer. It's not magic words, but it is one of meaning. Something with words that go like this. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen, amen. Friends, we rejoice with you as you embrace Jesus and invite him into your life.
Here's what I know. I know God will meet you as you come to him. And today we're going to open this altar that if you need someone to agree with you in prayer, we're going to have pastors and others come and pray with you in agreement. Maybe you just need to meet God. Maybe you need more of him. Maybe you need power to forgive or other things. Whatever it is that it would be between you and God, we just want to agree with you. Maybe you need healing. Maybe you need provision. That you would look to the Lord for all those things. We would agree with you today in prayer. Know this. God sees you where you are. And he loves you very much. He wants to transform you into his image. And call you to a destiny that's bigger than yourself. Thank you, Lord, so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for what you did in the life of Saul. Lord, that you loved us while we were yet sinners and you died for us. Lord, that you loved Saul enough that even while he was the enemy of the church, your people, Lord, that you loved him and you transformed his heart to use him as a mouthpiece for your glory. Lord, the same way, we ask that you would transform us Lord, that we would be used for your glory. Lord, we pray for the enemy that was flashes in our heart, Lord, that as we forgive, Lord, as you've forgiven us, Lord, too, you would use them and transform their, their life, Lord, to be used for your glory as a mouthpiece for your glory. Lord, for the jihadists today, we come and ask, Lord, for their hearts, Lord, for their life, reveal yourself to them, Lord, that they would turn and be used to plant your church in the most difficult places in the world. Lord, in all these things, we give you all the praise and all the glory. We pray them in the precious name that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, church. We're so glad that you joined us today. And I pray that God is speaking to you and just turning your heart towards him in every way. I just want to let you know Easter is here. It'll be here in two weeks. But in about a week, we have many events taking place. So when you head out today, grab some door hangers these small little flyers that you can hand out to neighbors, friends, co-workers. We have events at the Mercy House. We have a Good Friday service here. We have a Saturday family event in the morning, and then we have Sunday Easter service in two weeks. So we're excited. I want to encourage you, if you are available that Saturday, we need you. If you go on the church app or you let us know, we need you to come and participate. I need people on the grill. We need people watch inflatables. We need people just to have fun and love on the community as they come to our church and just are blessed. Amen. So if you can be here, we'd greatly appreciate it. Amen. We're excited for Easter. Hey, thank you for the uh, birthday blessings and greetings. We're so blessed in that way. Thank you to the church. We appreciate you guys very much. After this service, we actually have our annual business meeting for all those that are members of the church. We're going to start that just in a few minutes. If you just stay with us, we know others are coming back to participate with us in that way. We're excited. We get to celebrate what the Lord has been doing amongst us and give him praise for it. Before we go, let me pray this blessing over us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, I pray a blessing upon your church, your people. That you empower us by your spirit to live your love out to those around us. We pray this in the powerful name that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Know this. We love you very much here at Cornerstone. God bless you and have a great week.